Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew. I'm particularly excited to speak with you today because PyTorch Dev Day is one of the only times of the year when most of the world's top AI toolmakers get together in the same room and celebrate what we've built in the past year and also have a conversation about what we should build in the upcoming year. And so in this talk, I'm going to stick to this core conversation of PyTorch Dev Day. You know, what have we built and what do I think we should build next? So to ask the question, what have we built? I think that many of us, when we think about the recent history of AI tools, have a timeline in our heads that looks a lot like this. And this slide isn't designed to be you know, comprehensive, but at least to show what I think sticks out in our heads. There's this you know, pre-Theano world and post-Theano world, which we're now living in the heyday of with tools like PyTorch. And to state it quite plainly, the AI revolution happened in large part because of these tools. Like these tools made AI research, fundamental AI research, you know, easier, faster, more repeatable, more accessible for young researchers. There's just no telling how many amazing AI discoveries over the last 10 years that we wouldn't have without tools like PyTorch. You know, would we have GANs or Transformers or GPT-3? I, I honestly don't think that we would. You know, we'd still be fixing bugs in our handwritten backprop code and, and you know, frankly, waiting on CPUs to train. And this is the story of what we've built. The story is uh, world-class tools for accessing massive compute and state-of-the-art algorithms. You know, access to GPUs, TPUs, ASICs, you know, parallel training across big clusters. It takes seconds with PyTorch in the cloud. Whereas it used to take weeks to months to write your own custom CUDA code and get it into a GPU that you had to buy and set up yourself. And for models, you know, every state-of-the-art algorithm is available in a free toolkit within days of its publication, usable even by people who don't remotely understand how they work, right? Whereas, whereas before, only experts could use state-of-the-art tools because only experts knew how to write them from papers. And even then, it would take weeks to months to do so. But now we just pip install. It's incredible. Name another field where the world's leading expert can publish a technique and weeks later, a 12-year-old on YouTube can teach you how to use it, right? This tooling is incredible. So that's what we've built. And everyone here should feel enormously proud of what we have done. Provisioning compute and algorithms have gone from months of work to seconds of work. That is what we have done. So what should we do next? Well, what do we see consistently driving AI progress? And are all of those drivers being perfectly served by our tools? Let's take a look. Consider the last two years of language modeling progress on some task. You know, it looks like this. You know, it's interesting. When I look at this, all I see is algorithm development, people taking the last big innovation and tweaking it to drive down a score. Or maybe we can look at this. This is increase in model size, you know, aka increase in compute over the last two years. And GPT-3 isn't represented here. It's off the chart like 10 times higher, so I didn't include it. Um, but if you looked at it, you might conclude, uh, AI progress is just increasing compute and small continuous progress in algorithm research. Our tooling, PyTorch, is already delivering a near-perfect algorithm and compute experience. So maybe we're already solving all the big problems. Nothing left to do. But if we zoom out and look at a bigger picture, say over the last 10 years, it starts to look different. It's still mostly algorithm development, but I would argue that a lot of this algorithm development is actually data set development in disguise. And I want to call out three algorithms in particular, WordDevec, FastText, and GPT-3. Each of these models was published with a new, massive, cleaner data set, and none of them used radically different modeling techniques than previously published approaches, despite achieving radically different outcomes. And when we look at the last 20 years of language modeling, the last 30 years, the last 70 years of language modeling, data set size and quality continues to play a role in bringing about language modeling success. But moving beyond language modeling, consider the biggest AI milestones hailed by society. Deep Blue, based on the Negascout algorithm from 83, couldn't have beaten Garry Kasparov without the 25 million chess games published in 1991. IBM Watson, based on mixture of experts from, in, from 91, couldn't have won Jeopardy without 8.6 million structured Wikipedia documents being released in 2009. Microsoft Research couldn't have created the ImageNet moment for deep learning and image recognition without the ImageNet dataset, a collection of 14 million annotated images. Even AlphaGo is in part a data story. You know, adversarial learning, in effect, the ability to create a dataset of infinite size. But not just infinite size, infinite size of specific relevance to the model, right? It's no wonder this led to an absolutely massive breakthrough. So if AI progress runs on three ingredients, you know, 
bigger and better algorithms, more compute, and bigger, cleaner data. And any burst in availability of these core ingredients historically leads to huge AI breakthroughs. And our tools give us access to two out of the three. What should we be building next? We should be building tools for access to training and evaluation data. This is the missing piece of the AI tool chain. It used to take months to get access to GPU compute, you know, writing CUDA code, buying your own hardware. Now it takes seconds with PyTorch. It used to take months to get the state-of-the-art algorithm implementing both it and back propagation by hand. Now it takes seconds with PyTorch. And today, it still takes months to get access to real training data. And as a result, we, the entire AI community, reuse the same 10 data sets over and over and over and work on problems that frankly just don't matter. You know, handwritten digits, Wikipedia, predicting cats, but there's a whole host of problems out there, machine learning problems, that matter. And I dream of a world where NeurIPS, ICML, ICLR, these conferences, I dream of a world where these conferences matter to the everyday person. Because you know what? Right now, nobody cares, right? I mean, yes, we care. Okay, sure, the AI community cares. But the average person, they do not care because none of the innovations there really affect them, right? Nobody normal is sitting around their television night going, man, Betsy, did you hear about that new SoftMax? Can't wait till that gets on my phone, you know, recommending the next word when I text. That's going to change my life. Like nobody is saying that. But if we did fundamental AI research on problems that matter, real problems, problems like cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, depression, anxiety, disinformation. When we have AI breakthroughs, guess who else does too? The world. And NeurIPS transforms from an abstract conference irrelevant to the average person to a world's fair where breakthroughs in every academic field, healthcare, psychology, sociology, physics, happen year after year after year. It's a world where the results we produce directly matter to the lives of everyday people. That is the potential we unlock when our AI tools unlock safe, privacy-preserving access to the world's training and testing data. And if you ask me how massive of an AI wave are we in for when these privacy tools come online, you know, is it transformer big? Is it generative adversarial networks big? Is it GPU big? It's GPU big or bigger. And the reason it could be bigger is that the impact of compute and algorithms have been held back by lack of data. And when all three are in place, when, when, when you are in seconds away from any training data set, GPU compute cloud, or state-of-the-art algorithm, all at the same time, this is when the true AI revolution will begin. And it won't just be the same old AI revolution we've already seen, a revolution on handwritten digits and images of, images, images of cats. It's a simultaneous revolution in cancer, Alzheimer's, dementia, depression, sociology, psychology, geopolitics, global warming. That is what we should build. Because right now, it takes weeks to months for you to get access to an arbitrary data set. We need to get that down to seconds. And to do that, we need to solve one problem. Because the data already exists. The big data revolution happened. There's thousands of enterprises with data lakes now, billions of smartphones. So the problem we need to solve is this. Instead of people training only on data they already own, you know, one smartphone, one startup, one hospital, we need to make it possible to safely train on data we don't own. A thousand universities, 10,000 hospitals, a hundred million smartphones. If we solve this one problem, train and test on data that isn't yours, we unlock orders and orders of magnitude of data overnight. And while we have a lot of work to do to unlock access to 10,000 hospitals at a time, the first place to start is to be able to train on data from one other hospital. And today, OpenMind is extremely excited to release PySIF 0.3 with an important new capability we like to call Duet, but which you might call peer-to-peer -peer PyTorch over a Zoom call. In short, it's the ability for two personas, a data scientist and data owner, to create a peer-to-peer -peer connection so that the data scientist can remotely control PyTorch on the data owner's hardware, and the data owner controls what the data scientist is allowed to download. And to show us how this works, I have with me on video call Madhava J, who is calling from Brisbane, Australia. Madhava, how are you doing? Morning, Andrew, how are you going? Uh, good, good evening. Um, so over video chat, um, I'm going to perform data science and train a machine learning model on data that's inside of Madhava's machine. Uh, Madhava, if you could go ahead and launch a Duet server. No worries. Okay, so it's just running and uh, I'm getting some code here I can copy and paste to send to you. That contains my server ID. 
And when you run it, it will give you back a client ID to give to me to put in here, and that will pair the two sessions. Brilliant. Um, and so behind the scenes, when I give this ID back to Madhava, it's going to create a peer-to-peer -peer network connection between Madhava's laptop, you know, on Madhava's Wi-Fi, inside of Madhava's network, and my laptop here in Oxford, England. So Madhava, I just sent the code back to you. Okay. And so at the bottom of Madhava's screen, once this connects, you're going to see Duet Live Status, which says the number of objects, requests, and messages that have been handled by the server. So the number of objects in the object store. So now um, I'm going to go ahead and you know watch those numbers. I'm going to send this PyTorch tensor down to Madhava's machine. As you can see, the number of objects increments. I can go you know y equals x plus x, or use um, the the uh, PyTorch API there, so I can go, you know, y times y, and if I want to look at the result, I use this special dot get function, and this pulls the result back up to me. However, our goal is not to do, you know, remote execution. Our goal is for me to be able to train on Madhava's data. So, so data, uh, Madhava, will you please load in two data sets into the Duet server? There you go. Excellent. So now I am going to look inside of the Duet object store, pretty print as pandas, Excellent, looks like data and target in there. So the Duet store is the key value store that contains all of the uh, publicly searchable objects. And so now I have just populated two pointers that I can now use for model training. So let's create our model, simple linear model. Let's create, you know, instantiate our model and send it down to model this machine. We need an optimizer and a loss function. Now notice, instead of calling torch directly, I'm using duet.torch, which actually calls it on Madhava's library on his local machine. And then my training script, which is kind of using this standard PyTorch sort of small training script. Now, um, the problem is, you know, okay, training happened, you know, I just trained a machine learning model on Madhava's data on, on his machine. Um, now let's take a look at the loss. When I do so, I can't actually see what's going on because again, it's happening on private data. So if I go loss.get and try to download the loss to my machine, it's going to give me a permission error. And this permission error is saying, hey, this loss function was created you know, using a dynamic graph that had some inputs that were private data. So this, this might contain some of Madhava's private information in this variable, so you don't have permission to download it. Instead, I need to call loss.request, and um, I'm going to give a reason, which equals I want to see how accurate my model is. So I'm going to give this, this request. So that request has been issued now, Madhava. Madhava, you'll check and see if the request is in your request queue. So it's in yep. Madhava's request queue. Would you want to accept it? Perfect. Thank you so yep. much. Um, and so now if I go back over here and I go loss.get, it actually lets it come through. But this isn't just enough. This is a bit cumbersome, you know. So so when I'm actually training, I'd rather see loss variables come through as it's training so I can kind of watch how things are going. Um, and so now, Madhava, I would like for you to um, pre-approve nine numbers to come through as long as the get request is labeled with the variable name. Oh, brilliant. So I'm going to go request block equals true and name equals loss. Um, so I'm going to set that up here. So my, um, and now that's, I'm going to ask for 10 numbers, so 10 loss numbers, but he's only giving me a quota of nine. So the first nine through are going to come through, but the last one is going to give me a none because it it uh, is sort of denying me the ability to pull, pull out that number. And again, this is really just a convenience operation to make it possible for me to train on Madhava's data, for him to give me some level of reporting back, assuming we're kind of on this sort of screen share and we have some idea of what context is going on in, in the environment. Um, Madhava, thank you so much for letting me train a model on your data. Thanks, Andrew. Have a great day. See ya. So as you can see, Duet makes it possible for a data scientist in one part of the world to use PyTorch in a data repo in a different part of the world, all while the data owner gets to control what information the data scientist is able to learn. Now this might beg the question, how do these people actually meet each other? And it's based on that question, I'm very excited to announce the second release from the OpenMind community today, which is a platform called OpenGrid. OpenGrid.OpenMind.org is a website that, that registers private data and models so that data scientists can find data and models that are relevant to their problem. So if you are someone who might be interested in experimenting with, with private data sets or models, or you might be someone who has data sets or models that could be interested for, for data scientists, I highly recommend you go to opengrid.openmind.org, sign up for an account, and train some models in some duet sessions. 
Um, I hope you've enjoyed sort of this last pitch on how the future of AI tools could, could move forward. And I will see you around PyTorch Dev Day. Mm-hmm.